Despite being over 50 years old, it's still a classic Atkinson & Schifrin's multi-store model of memory. So why is it so famous? In this video, I'm going to explain what the model is, how it explains memory, why it's so famous and still popular 50 years later today, and maybe most importantly for you, how you can use it to score top marks in your exams. And I'm going to give you a few little details that might not be in your textbooks, just so you can distinguish your answers from the rest. So as the name suggests, the multi-store model of memory explains the formation of memories, how memories are formed, based on three separate stores. So I'm gonna to try to explain the multi-store model using the multi-store model, your memory of my explanation of this model. Is that going to matter? I think it should be fine. First of all, let's begin with the sensory stores. In order to remember something, information has to pass through your senses. You're hearing my voice right now. You're seeing this diagram. This stuff is coming through your visual and auditory senses. We eat something, we taste something, we feel something. So information passes into our sensory stores. Now importantly, Atkinson and Schifrin suggested there were multiple sensory stores. Well, they called them sensory registers. Different stores for different types of information. What we see, hear, smell, taste, etc. Right, now if you pay attention to the information coming through your senses, it's going to transfer into your short-term store. That makes sense, right? If you suddenly tuned out from the sound of my boring voice, you stop paying attention, you're not going to be focusing on what I'm saying, you're not going to remember it. Now the short-term store is your working memory. This is the small amount of information you can hold in your mind at any one time. It lasts about 15 to 30 seconds and we can only focus on a few things. Now, information in your short-term memory can be transferred to your long-term memory if you rehearse it, if you go over it, if you think about it enough, right? So rehearsal, repeating something in your mind, going over it again and again, according to this model, is gonna transfer that memory to your long-term store. Now, but what if you need to remember something, right? You need to bring something back from your long-term memory into your short-term memory so you can do something with it, so you can remember. Well, that happens through uh, search processes and retrieval processes, right? So we search our long-term store, we're racking our brain, and then we can retrieve that information back into our short-term store. So a quick recap of the multi-store model. There are three stores, and the information travels between them through, from these control processes, right? We pay attention to what comes into our sensory information, that transfers to our short-term store. If we rehearse it, it transfers to our long-term, and we can remember things, we bring it back through retrieval. Also, according to the model, there's a few different ways we can forget, like information might decay from our short-term store if we don't rehearse it enough, that doesn't make a, a strong enough memory trace in the long-term store, or maybe displacement, so as new items come into our short-term store, they might kick some of the other stuff out, uh, and through interference and decay in our long-term store as well. But maybe in a separate video, I might make a whole multi-store model of forgetting video, but I think for now, we've got enough detail to write a good uh, explanation. So why are we learning about this model after 50 years? Why is the multi-store model by Atkinson and Schifrin so popular even today and you have to learn about it in your psychology course? Well for one thing, the multi-store model came about in the cognitive revolution of the 1950s and 60s when there was a whole plethora, a new spark of studies in memory. And this was in reaction to the behaviorist movement earlier which said, look, we can't see the mind, we can't study the mind scientifically because we can't observe it, so let's not. And they focused on just observable actions only. But in the 50s and 60s, a whole bunch of studies were done on memory when they applied the scientific process uh, to the studies of memory and cognition. And this is from which the multi-store model was born and plus a whole bunch of other theories about memory were born as well. So, the multi-store model, actually, this is important to note, it wasn't an original theory in the sense that they didn't come up with these ideas. Atkinson and Schifrin took a whole bunch of existing ideas that emerged from the studies and combined it in their 110-page original framework. And so, in that sense, let's talk a little bit about the studies that demonstrate the multi-store model. There are three main studies we can use to explain and support the multi-store model, which came out of that cognitive revolution I just talked about. I'll go into more detail in these in future videos, but first, the three studies are HM's case study, Glanzer and Kunitz primacy and recency effect, and Peterson and P Peterson. HM's study suggests uh, and supports the idea that our memory is in different stores. Peterson and Peterson can show that rehearsal is necessary for transfer and that uh, our short-term store has a limited duration. Memory tends to uh, disappear or decay if we don't rehearse the information. And 
Glands Room Qnits also supports the idea of rehearsal being needed for transfer uh, and information in our short term store only lasts a short time as well. I'm going to go into more detail of those studies in a separate video. Another reason the multi-store model is so popular is that it sparked a whole nother generation of psychologists to study these specific processes and some of these stores in more detail. So for example, the working memory model by Baddeley and Hitch is an elaboration of the short-term store. Robert Schifrin actually went on to develop new models of memory, the SAM, the SAM model, the search of associative memory, and later the REM model, the remembering effectively memory model. Maybe I've misremembered that effectively. The retrieving effectively from memory model. And so this model sparked future research into memory processes. Another possible reason you're learning about the multi-store model and it's in every introduction to psychology textbook and curriculum is because it's quite simple and basic. It's a very straightforward explanation of memory so we feel like it's valid uh, and, and useful to explain to high school students and beginning college students for psychology. But that's one of the very critiques of the multi-store model is that it oversimplifies some of the memory processes and I'll explain more of those in another video where I go into some more detail of the limitations of the multi-store model. But for now I think it's enough just to understand this basic summary. However, if you want to use this in your exams and get really high marks, firstly I recommend definitely diagram the model. There's nothing wrong with drawing a diagram in exams and essays. In fact, when I mean, you're explaining something right, why not have a visual diagram as long as you write a written explanation as well. But let me just go into a little more detail in the multi-store model. So you've got a couple of things I think might help you distinguish your answer. First of all, did you know in the short-term store, there's a store within the store. It's called the rehearsal buffer. So in the short-term store, Atkinson and Schifrin propose this idea of a rehearsal buffer. So this is where we place the information that we're going over, we're rehearsing, we're trying to think about in our minds, right? We're going over it again and again to try to remember it. And this rehearsal buffer only can hold a few items. So anytime new information comes in, when the buffer gets full, old information has to be removed. And this is called displacement. This is how forgetting can happen in the short-term store. When we overload our short-term memory, there's too much to remember, the new information kicks out the old information. It's a first in, first out principle. So when you're talking about the multi-store model, if, as long as you understand what I mean by the rehearsal buffer, right? It's a, it's a store within the store where information that we're actively rehearsing is held, then definitely Put it in your explanation. Also, one other little fun fact about the multi-store model, Atkinson and Schifrin isn't the only MSM. It's not the only model of memory. It's not the only multi-store model of memory. In fact, it wasn't even the first. Murdoch, a year earlier in 1967, proposed his multi-store model of memory. But then actually Murdoch was using studies by Atkinson and Schifrin from 1965. And so the idea here is that the model was, again, a combination of ideas that came out of the 50s and 60s, that cognitive revolution that sparked all these studies into the mind and memory. Now, how valid is the multi-store model today? Well, some people would argue, some critics of this would say, why are we even bothering talking about different, different stores? It doesn't matter. We should be focusing on individual specific memory processes, not whether or not they're stored in different compartments. It's archaic. But that's even another point with the multi-store model. Atkinson and Schifrin weren't even the, the first ones to propose the idea of separate stores. William James, the father of American psychology, proposed this idea back in the 1800s, almost 100 years earlier to these guys. So that wasn't a revolutionary idea either. Again, what they did was they combined it in one unitary framework. This diagram, if you're confused that you are seeing lots of different diagrams of the multi-store model and everyone seems to have it a little different, well that's because in their original article they never put it into a diagram. They never actually constructed this into a diagram. So everyone's had to construct their own and that's why they might look a little different. That confused me for a long time where I thought, wait, why are all these multi-store models different? That's the reason. All right, so what I did there was I tried to keep it nice and simple. If you were paying attention, then that information went to your short-term store, but in order for you to remember it into your long-term, for you to be able to use it and retrieve it during the exams, you've got to rehearse it and go over it again and again. Here's how I recommend remembering the multi-store model. Think of it in three separate ways. First, you've got the stores. You must be able to label and identify the three separate stores and their characteristics. Sensory store, unlimited information can go in, but it only lasts a few hundred milliseconds. Short-term store, very limited amount of information and lasts about 15 to 30 seconds. Long-term store, unlimited information and it can last a lifetime. It's permanent memory. So that's how you describe the stores. The other structures, 
The second major claim is the control processes, how the information moves between these stores. So attention from sensory to short term, rehearsal from short term to long term, and search and retrieval from long term back into the short term memory. Also, you might wanna add some of those historical context details I mentioned that the model came out of the cognitive revolution. Interestingly, the model was proposed after most of the studies that are used to support it, the primacy and recency effect, Peterson and Peterson and HM. So the model was based on the studies, not the studies being conducted after to test the model. You might want to also briefly talk about the applications of the multi-store model, and then it led to further developments in other theories like the search of associative memory, the remembering effectively, retrieving effectively from memory, the REM, and the working memory model. The last thing to do is come up with some limitations. You see any problems with this model? Right, and try to identify those for yourself first. And if you need help, I'm gonna make a video in the future that outlines some of these limitations to consider. All right, I hope that was helpful. If it was, please leave a comment. It's quite hard to explain all of this in one coherent go. This is my eighth time recording this video, so I really hope it was helpful. I'm trying to get better. Anyway, thank you, good luck.